Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about the Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning II. And this is a physics project on this airplane and a report about its uh, capabilities and physics concepts related to this. And I'm Jason Chang. So before we get into the physics part of the presentation, let's talk about a little bit about the history of the uh, F-35. The F-35 is originally designed mainly by Lockheed Martin with a, a, a different companies participating in the design process such as Northrop Grumman. Uh, Lockheed actually competed in a competition called the Joint Strike Fighter Program, JSF. And this is developed by the United States government, the Department of Defense in 2001. And Lockheed competed against another company, which is very famous called Boeing. The company developed the X-35, which later will be called the F-35, while Boeing developed the X-32, which lost. So, the entire funding for the program was uh, directed to Lockheed because they were the winners. And other countries also helped with this program, such as the United Kingdom or Britain, Australia, Canada, Italy, Norway, Denmark, or the Netherlands, as well as NATO. So the purpose of the, this program is to develop uh, developed by the United States government or the Department of Defense is to replace uh, older generation of fighters with new top technology of the 21st century. So in the this picture you can see on the right is the F-35, while on the left is the F-32. So this was, on the left side it was developed by Boeing, which eventually lost the competition. The F-35 the main purpose of the F-35 is the idea of multi-use or multi-purpose because it's simple physical design with no uh, crazy edges or crazy um, design physically makes it very uh, comp compatible with different scenarios such as land, sea, and air. And this is a very new uh, idea compared to previous generations of technology, which I will talk about later. Some fun facts about this is that the U US has uh, bought over 2000 F-35s through 2044. And this will represent and replace a large portion of the United States Air Force, Navy and Marine. And the, the uh, technology and the generation technology in this aircraft is predicted to be capable until 2070. Because this program is such a large program, there is criticism, obviously, for the uh, designs, for delays, and also its size, as it is only one engine and one seat compared to other more general airplanes where there is at least two seats. However, it has the capability of taking off vertically and landing. The plane entered service in two, uh, July 2015, which means uh, it is the date where it first uh, became active and the first one was delivered and tested. So key attributes of the fighter. So what are its details? It is uh, capable of having stealth, which is uh, in English terms, basically in becoming invisible to the radar. So it is able to also uh, perform strike missions and establish air superiority. This means that it is able to um, basically launch, do this mission and land. Key technology uh, provides this uh, airplane with electronic warfare, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. So this is uh, another term for this is mapping in the battle. 
there are three configurations. So this is uh, the main purpose of this aircraft is very configurable or it has a multi-purpose. And the F-35A is a CETO. So what this means is it is a, like a normal airplane where it takes off from a runway in the airport. So it's a conventional takeoff and landing. F-35B is a STOVL, which means short takeoff and vertical landing. This is an example of the right picture here, where it is able to take off vertically uh, in a short distance. So it is not 100% uh, vertical takeoff landing. However, there's a short takeoff and vertical landing. So it's able to have a shorter runway. Uh, compared to the CETO version, which is the F-35A. The last version, which in my opinion is uh, the better one, is the F-35C. And this is able to 100% take off vertically, which is shown in the right. The purpose of this is because um, many of uh, this airplane is going to be purchased by the Navy. So a lot of the airplane will actually be launched in on the ocean in uh, aircraft carriers. So you need a uh, aircraft that is capable of taking off vertically or landing unless you have a longer runway, which is not possible in the middle of the ocean. So this configuration is called CVCATO bar. So the technology behind the F-35 is apart from its stealth capability, which is the capability of becoming invisible to the radar, which I will talk more about in detail about the physics behind the stealth. It also has the capability to take off vertically and land. So this is the F-35C version. So getting a more complex idea, the design uses one engine so as you can see in the bottom, the engine is able to turn with more than 90 degrees. So instead of pointing back, the engine is able to point downwards. There's also a separate large fan in the front of the plane, and this directs the uh, engine thrust through a shaft that turns the fan. So as you can see, the, as the engine produces thrust, it also turns the shaft. So this is similar to what's inside the car where the engine powers the shaft that turns the wheels. So the shaft turns the um, fan in the front, which balances out the plane because the plane's center of mass is towards the back as the engine is the heaviest, heavier portion of the plane. So the center of mass is around two thirds of the plane length as I research from a website. And this uh, shaft uh, co connected to the large fan also has smaller mini fans, as you can see here, that provide lift too. So this four point lift is a perfect balance for the plane uh, compared to a two point lift where it, it may be able to uh, tilt uh, sideways, which is very dangerous. Uh, some more technology are the electronical systems are very complicated, among the most complicated ever designed. A concept that I research about is called sensor fusion. And this, <clears throat> this is the process of combining sensor data that is used to basically uh, help the pilot. So what this does is it is uh, similar to autopilot, where it's helping the pilot, but uh, in order to do tasks while the pilot is uh, in flight in the sky. And the sensors used are such as the ANAPG81, which is a radar, or the ANNAAQ40, which is a EOTS, or electrical optical targeting system. So what this does is it's able to identify another object in the sky. The plane is able to detect another plane before the other plane is able to detect it. So this is the uh, this is why a lot of countries want this airplane. It's because 
it is able to find the enemy quicker than the enemy is able to find him as of uh, the present day. The APG-81 radar uses a new technology called the rapid beam agility technology. So what this, what this is, is it shoots many beams in an air-to-air -air passive way where it does not harm the environment. So it's not detectable by the human. However, the beams are able to scan the, uh, the environment and the surrounding uh, uh, area of the plane to track objects. Uh, uh, another important area I noticed is the antenna, which is tilted. So because the airplane is uh, a stealth airplane where it's invisible to the radar, the antenna is actually not invisible to the radar. So the antenna is tilted in order to hide away inside the plane so the radar cannot detect it. Now let's get into the physics of the airplane. So first of all, before uh, applying uh, concepts of physics one, let's talk about the physics of stealth. So stealth on the F-35 is more advanced than previous generations. And it's actually using a special secret coating developed by the United States government. And this secret coating has a material and a a secret thickness to absorb radar waves. So the radar energy is absorbed and converted to heat. So this, uh, this, the, the energy is technically dissipated. So we can call it a dissipated energy. And this is converted into the heat. So this heat is just dissipated away. And the signal is becomes weaker as it bounces off the airplane. So this radar absorbent material has a high absorbency at radio frequency. So it's at the frequency of a radio wave. We can know, uh, see the frequency equation here that we learned. Uh, F is equal to one over T and T here is the period. So the larger the period, the smaller the F in Hertz. As we can see in the right side, Here is actually uh, the equation of a radar that I researched. So as you can see here, PR is the power returning to the receiver. So this is basically the, uh, a frequent, uh, the absorbency. So if it has a high absorbency, then the PR will be lower because less, uh, there will be more dissipated energy, dissipated heat. So less uh, waves are returned to the receiver. So the receiver is the radar in the ground that is trying to find the plane. PT is the transmitted power. So this is the power that is going from the radar towards the plane. However, because the PR is in the numerator, we can see here, then we, we want more power to return to the receiver, which is why you want a positive power here and you want a larger PR. However, the F-35 will uh, decrease this PR because of the secret special coating. And I actually, I'm not too sure about this because it is uh, confidential, it's not released to the public. And the area of the receiver is also important because the larger the area, it's actually the harder to detect because it is in the denominator here. And you want less area in order to become easier to detect. So this is why the F-35 has a very jagged edges in order to uh, make th uh, the plane less visible to human also, which, which is also true for the radar. So this is very important, the A in the denominator. And the pattern is also important, however, this is not really an important concept for the plane to become stealthy. But, and also due to us not knowing the thickness of the material, this is not determinable. So this is basically the, what the radar equation tells us. So the numerator and the denominator is very important. Now let's get into the physics one. So Newton's laws relation to the F-35. So, 
The F-35 applies all three Newton laws. First law is uh, where the net force is equal to zero, where at rest or at cruising speed, there's no acceleration. And I'll show a diagram of this later on. So during takeoff and landing, the net force equals mass times acceleration. And this is the Newton's second law, where the net force does not equal zero. And because the engine produces thrust, it receives an equal and opposite action-reaction force. And this action and reaction force is Newton's third law. So because the engine produces thrust, it will receive a reaction force. And this reaction force will, will propel the plane forward. Newton's third law is also applied in the wings of the airplane. So in the tip of the wing, the air is uh, forcing down the wing. However, the reaction of this is the wing pushing the air up, the air pushing the wind up. And this is why many airplanes have a trailing edge that create lift to compensate the force caused by an air drag and gravity. Key word here is a compensate. So here you can see the Newton's uh, laws diagrams. And for Newton's first law, you can see that the thrust and the drag are, are equal. So they, they uh, not equal, but they cancel each other out. So the net force here is zero because it is at constant speed. So what we call this is cruising or balanced forces. So here you can see the lift and the weight are balanced the drag and the thrust are balanced. There's no net force uh, present. So the net force here is zero. So this is Newton's first law. However, here you can see Newton's second law. You can see that the thrust is uh, bigger than the drag here. So the drag is more than the thrust, uh, is less than the thrust. So in this case, uh, there is a net force. So net force is equal to the mass time acceleration. Uh, another concept important to talk about is the thrust to weight ratio. And this is uh, basically the ratio between the thrust, which net force is ma, weight, which is mg. So it's a relationship between ma and mg, so a over g. This ratio is important for airplanes to determine its speed because uh, a thrust to weight ratio, you want more thrust and less weight to have a faster plane. This is because thrust is numerator and weight is denominator. So if you have a larger weight, then your airplane will become slower. So in order to become faster, you need a larger thrust. Now let's talk about Newton's third law. So uh, in the... Uh, a general case for airplane, you can see that this uh, trailing edges here provide the lift. So because the air provides this action force, lift has to counteract it with a reaction force. So action, air is deflected downwards by the wing. Reaction, wing deflects upwards. So this is action reaction. And same thing for propellers. Propeller push, pushes uh, forward which is the reaction force. And for action, air is pushed and pulled backwards by the propeller. So this propeller is what we see in the uh, forward part of the F-35. And another diagram here is basically showing the uh, uh, Newton's third law in the wing tip. So you can see that the flow is deflected down, the foil is deflected up. So the air foil is going up here while the flow is deflected down. So this is the action and the reaction. Now let's talk about a little uh, fun topic is the physics of night vision. So the plane actually has a night vision capability where it's able to see the night. So it actually uses a thermal infrared radiation. And we actually learned the, uh, uh, inf uh, the uh, visible spectrum the light spectrum. So the infrared radiation has a wavelength of between 780 nm and 1 nm. So this night vision takes advantage of this IR 
which is categorized as having a longer wavelength than visible light. And night vision basically uh, emits this thermal radiation to be able to see the infrared. So as you can see in the right picture where this is taken with the night vision goggle, the engines and the lights are very hot. So you can see how the heat is very present and the lights are uh, very, very bright red. So you can see because the wavelengths of uh, 700, 80 and between 780 and 1 is very visible for uh, uh, places such as the engine or the cockpit. However, uh, colder places and places with the uh, stealth coating, such as the body, you can see is more dark. So this is the uh, night vision relationship uh, to physics, the wavelength. And the technology behind this, I did a little research, is the optoelectronic image enhancement. So what this does is it changes the light, uh, infrared light, to more of a green color, as you can see here. So it's amplified this. So the red light has longer wavelength than green light, So whereas the red has a lower frequency. So this is why you can see here, it's actually more green uh, after it has gone through the optoelectronic image enhancement, which basically amplifies this, this color. Uh, finally, uh, we're going to talk about engines. So the aircraft uses uh, Pratt and Whitney F-135 low bypass turbofan. So this actually produces a lot of thrust for, uh, for, for 43,000 pounds, pounds per force or 191 kN. And a uh, um, fun fact here is that the engine flaps here, you can see here, is actually angled because this is sticking out of the airplane. All of this is inside the airplane, but this is outside the airplane. So why is this? First is to direct the airflow, but second is actually to reduce the radar signature. So this is once again, uh, the engineer thought of this because of the stealth. And this reducing of radar signature will make it uh, more invisible to the radar. And the afterburner is actually a low observable augmenter. So it has thick, thick veins, as you can see here, thick veins uh, in order to produce this thrust. So the purpose of afterburner for people that don't know, what, uh, not too familiar with this is more uh, fuel is injected into the engine to boost the thrust. So you, you're using more fuel, but you're getting more uh, thrust. So this is actually able to take the speed of the plane to a higher level. The exert, uh, as, uh, again here, it, the exhaust is able to be diverted through openings. So the exhaust is able to turn 90 degrees towards the ground in order to uh, vertically take off and land. So a, a little bit of the physics of engine is actually applying the conservation of momentum. So the jet engine applies the COM in the shortcut or the conservation of momentum, because you can see here, M air times the V air plus M plane times V plane is equal to M air times V air prime plus M plane times V plane prime. So in the diagram here, you can see that the momentum of the plane here is constant. And the velocity air towards the back will produce a greater velocity of the plane towards the front because that has to be equal to the velocity of the air uh, in the back uh, plus the velocity of the plane in the front. So this actually uh, equals out. So how this works is the plane takes in the air through the front and it expels it through the back. So it's kind of a push push relationship. So the air is pulled in and then pushed out. So pull push relationship. And in the front, the air is actually not too fast because it's normal air in the atmosphere. But when the air is sucked in, it's compressed. And this compressed air is accelerated because of another concept where I, I will talk about later. So the P is constant here. So the plane will propel forward. And a couple of diagrams you can see here is 
the uh, construction of a more uh, no, uh, general case for the engine of this plane. So the first part is the fan. So this is what pulls the air in. So it's rotating in order to pull the air in. And uh, another important is the case encoding. So it has to have a strong case in order for the engine to not fail. The compressor here is the second part of the engine. So after the fan, this sucks. Uh, this is what compresses the air after the fan sucks it in. It has a lot of uh, uh, smaller blades compressing the air even more towards the middle. Next, the combustor, actually what, where the fuel injects into the uh, chamber and heats the air up, which it will be, uh, become faster and propel away. So the turbine will thus help the propel, uh, the propelling of the air out, out through the back. So the pull-push relationship. The shaft and the structural part is just to keep the engine very uh, stable and very sturdy so it won't break. Uh, more physics concepts I'll talk about outside physics. One is the ideal gas law. And this is applied because the PV NRT relationship where it relates the temperature to the pressure and the volume. So hotter gases actually uh, take up more volume because it's expanding and the molecules are further apart compared to the colder, colder gases. So this can be related to the conservation momentum. So we can use both of them at the same time to explain the engine of the airplane. Because the best scenario is to take in the air in the front, compress it, increasing the stored mass. So if you compress the air, you can store more in amount of volume. So if you have a, a water bottle, you can store more air in it if you compress it. So this compression makes the, the molecules inside more compact. And the fuel here is injected into this compacted air, which is then heated up. So this heat up is what, what, where we apply the ideal gas law. So the heat up will expand uh, the molecules taking up more space. And this hotter gases takes up more volume and it wants to escape the, the water bottle. So then it will, if we open the water bottle, the gases will go out of the water bottle. So this is same with the engine too. The compressed air pulled through the front will go out after it gets, heat, it gets heated up by the fuel. And this fuel heated up expands all, all the air at once will provide a lot of thrust and velocity. So this is how the engine works and also the relationship to the physics concepts outside of physics one. Uh, some independent research I did is on the Venturi effect. And this effect is basically why you see the engine has a very big front and a very small back because the Venturi effect states that if there's a rigid tube, so this is definition, one end is larger, the air is the same in and out. So th there's still the same amount of air coming in and going out, but it's just the speed of the air that's different because matter doesn't change. It's not actually also law of thermodynamics too, because you, you cannot create or destroy anything. And using conservation of mechanical energy here, you can see as the air passes through the tight area and gets compressed, it will increase velocity and the pressure will decrease, but there's no energy that is lost or dissipated. So this is the key concept. Energy coming in goes out too, no dissipated. Uh, in a perfect scenario, obviously there's dissipated energy due to, the, due to the air drag, friction and other things. For example, friction on the wall and air drag, but in the perfect scenario, no energy is lost or dissipated. This is why airplane engine is very big in the front. So also this is uh, comparing to another, another uh, topic like rocket engine is why rocket engine have the bell shape too, because you want that lot of pressure at that one moment in order to push everything out the back. And I thought about it for my creativity point for the project. So if, uh, if I were able to change the design of the plane, 
I would in, uh, actually add more engines. I think it's actually a good idea to add more engine because it gives this argument for safety. So I think uh, talking about all of this, safety is not really too important, but it's actually very important to the pilot. So if you have meant more than one engine, it actually makes, so if one engine fail, you're still able to land the plane, somewhat land the plane. So it increases the safety margin. Even though there are ejection seats, so the pilot is able to escape the plane uh, if the plane has a, uh, if the plane fails. Adding another engine ensures more, uh, less chance of this failure. So less chance of the pilot having any trouble. So I think it's actually a pretty good idea to add another engine. However, I believe there's a good argument for why the scientists and engineers choose one engine. Another creativity aspect is uh, adding more than one seat. So because the criticism a lot of uh, engineers got after making the plane due to it only having one seat, so I think adding another seat will actually help communication because if you have another person in the back, it's better to talk uh, between physical in order other than electrical. So if you are, you're on the plane and you actually forgot how to, for example, operate something, communicating with the ground or the people in the ground or in the station is actually could be harder than just communicating with someone behind you. So this is why I, uh, it's possibility to for the creativity to add maybe one more seat and one more engine. That's what I uh, my opinion. Uh, and overall project opinion and thoughts. And I think it's very interesting learning about how complicated this plane is. And the overall system applies so many concepts of physics. And I can't talk about all of the concepts because there's too many, uh, including even fluid mechanics, uh, which uh, I is not talk about in physics one, but what's talk about is energy conservation, Newton's laws, wave concepts, and even light concepts, such as infrared radiation with a stealth coating such as the physics of stealth. So I found it very interesting that even light is involved in this uh, airplane design. Uh, thank you and hopefully this was helpful in learning about the F-35 and my thoughts behind the physics about this engineering uh, product. Thank you so much.